Welcome back to another episode of an Investor's Journey podcast. I am your host, Jonathan Barbera, and I wanted to continue the series that I told you. So we started first with wholesaling, which was last week's episode. And this week, I want to talk about how to get started in flipping. So I know flipping is something everybody wants to get into. You know, it's it's the fun part of real estate. There's uh, a lot of cool stuff because you, you're taking something that's really, really ugly and making it look awesome, right? And it looks really cool on Instagram. <laughs> but uh, so I wanted to cover pretty much, this is going to be more or less like a 20,000 foot view on this because flipping, unlike what most of you may think, is an extremely advanced strategy. Flipping is not something that you should be starting in, all right? You should be doing other areas of real estate to get your feet wet, to get you kind of understanding how the market works, how investors work, how the buyers are working and all of that. But that being said, there's a lot of people that still rather just jump in at the deep end and figure it out. So I'm hoping that with this episode, I can share a little more clarity for you uh, as far as what to expect, how to protect yourself, how to protect your investors, um, and hopefully you won't lose that much money. <laughs> so first thing, keeping certain, I wanted to start with is things that you wanted to keep in mind when it comes time to flipping. And the biggest thing is that fear of missing out. Do not become a motivated buyer. Okay. A lot of people are becoming motivated buyers. They feel like the deal that was presented to them is the best deal. The only deal there's never going to be another deal ever again. That's going to meet that criteria. That's not the case. All right. Just how that deal came about. There's going to be plenty of more deals to come about. Real estate is not going anywhere. All right. People still need a roof over their head. We haven't evolved into a species that doesn't need to live indoors. So real estate is always going to be here. There's always going to be another deal. Don't rush it. Don't get pressured into it. I did an episode. I think it was like two weeks ago where it was like, beware of the investor. And I did another one. Beware of the wholesaler. Both of those tend to have a lot of pressure from those people for you to buy this deal, right? They always tell you, oh, I have five, 10 more people looking at this. You know, this is going to go fast. Better hurry up. Don't fall for that. This is a serious business, okay? Don't jump into it just because somebody's pushing you to do it. Take your time. Understand what you're doing. There's always going to be another deal. And where this one is going to help you is understanding the analysis part, right? So even if you take too long on this one and you lose it on the next one, you'll get a little bit faster and a little bit better. And that's the goal is to get faster, better, and understand this much better. So when you do decide to buy, you don't make such a big mistake. So I hope that makes sense. The next thing, always look to partner, especially when you're just starting off. This takes away so much risk, so much headache, and so much un unknown away from you. If you partner with the right person, the right investor, you have no idea how much more you're going to learn, how less stress you're going to be, and how much more success you're going to have. There are so many people, so, so many people, unfortunately, that get into this they don't partner because truly the majority of the time is just greed because it's not like, oh, I want to learn it myself. No, you're just being an idiot, all right? Because you can still learn by partnering. The point is greed. You want that profit, right? And it's fine. It's fine for you to want the money. Just understand that it's not going to happen that quickly. And almost every single person, I've yet to meet somebody that this hasn't happened to, they either lose a lot of money or don't make enough as they should have. All right. So what do I mean by that is a lot of people, they say, yeah, I flipped this house and you know, yeah, I made 10 grand and they consider that a win. My thing is like, how do you know that you couldn't have made 20, 30, 40 grand on it? They don't know. They don't know if they could have made more because they don't know what they're doing. You understand? So you don't know what you don't know 
which is why you partner. You made 10 grand on your own. You probably screwed up a lot and you probably still didn't learn as much because you don't know what you screwed up in. There are so many people that they end up flipping a house, they screw up and they still don't know why. They don't understand what mistake they made that took them to losing money or to not make it enough. They don't know. They don't have the experience of somebody that's done it time and time again, telling them, well, here's where you screwed up or don't do that because this is going to happen or don't do this because that's going to happen. Right. And at least you have that knowledge, whether you decide to do it or not, it's your point, it's your investment, but at least you have that knowledge of should I, should I not do that? So I hope that makes sense. Now, the last thing on things to keep in mind is that there is no such thing. All right. Pay attention. I'm being serious. There is no such thing as an investor friendly contractor. Okay. Investor friendly contractor does not exist. Get that shit out of your head, please. Okay. What you're asking for is either a contractor that knows more about flipping than you do or a contractor that's so cheap that's going to make this deal make you money. Both of those are terrible reasons to get a contractor, okay? From personal experience, everything that we share on this podcast is our own experience. Contractors, the majority of them, and I would just for not saying all of them, don't know the work that needs to be done. They know the work, how to do the work but they don't know what work needs to be done. We recently have a contractor building a house for us and he wanted to put 30 inch cabinets on a 10 foot ceiling in the kitchen, right? That looks completely terrible. I don't care how much money you're going to save. It's going to look terrible, but they don't know that because they're not investors. They're contractors, right? It's not their fault whatsoever. It's your fault because you're not, you're not telling them you're not, you don't have the knowledge to guide them. So please don't look for an investor friendly contractor. Look for a good contractor, somebody that you're hiring because they're good at what they do. All right. So let that sink in. No such thing as an investor friendly contractor. So we're going to cover three things in this. Um, we're going to cover the analysis part, the, the actual flip process, and then the sell process. All right. So let's start with the analysis. You need to determine the true value. So this is before you go ahead and close on the deal. You want to make sure that the numbers make sense. If you are going based on a wholesaler or an investor's numbers, uh, you kind of deserve to lose your ass because you're being extremely lazy. Don't do that. Take the time and run your numbers. Do your own due diligence. You need to understand what this is because as soon as they hand that property off to you, it's no longer their problem. It becomes your problem. And if you didn't do your analysis, you don't know what you're doing. All right. You don't have a roadmap to where you're going. So you need to determine the true value. In determining the true value, you need to understand the difference between appraised value and perceived value. So I did a podcast, uh, I don't know, maybe a year ago or something explaining this whole process. So I'm gonna link to that podcast here, but you want to understand the difference. So real quick, we did a house recently that we did a make ready rehab, just very light cosmetic stuff because we're keeping it as a rental. The house appraised as an ARV house, right? So it appraised for 160. We know though that the perceived value is not 160. And what that means is that if we ended up putting it on the market right now for 160, we're not going to get a buyer to come in and pay that. Even though it appraises, even though an appraisal an appraiser came and said, "Yes, it's worth 160." A buyer is going to come in and say, "No, I'm not paying 160 because this house down the street that sold for 160 has granite countertops and has all the nice stuff. Ours doesn't." You understand? So that is the big difference. And it's the same thing. Just because you over improve a house and you're going to have a buyer saying all day long, I want to buy, I'll pay 160 all day long. And it appraises for less. You have another issue there, right? Because unless that buyer is willing to come in with a difference, 
you're not going to sell. So the appraised and the perceived value, they need to be, you need to understand those. Our, our rule of thumb, what we typically do is we target appraised value first. What do we need to do for this house to appraise at its maximum value? Once we get that, then we see what do we need? What little tweaks and stuff can we do to add more perceived value to this house over our competitors? All right. So where this all ties in on is when you are determining your ARV. So for those of you that don't know, ARV um, is the after repair value or after renovated value or after whatever R you want to use. Um, it's pretty much what the house is going to sell for once it's all fixed up, ready to go. So you are looking in the market, in that local market, what other houses that are the same, similar square footage, similar year build, sim uh, same neighborhood, same side of town, everything. You want apples to apples. What is the nicest house there? That What does it look like and what is it selling for? That's going to give you a comp. Okay, that's a comparable to your house. So if you get your house to look like this one, you can bet that it will sell around this price point. Okay, so that is what the ARV is. And once you determine this ARV, that's how you can submit your offer pretty much. So the rule of thumb is 70% of ARV minus repairs. The way that formula breaks down is you determine what the ARV is. So let's call it just to use simple round numbers, let's call it $100,000 is your ARV. 70% of that is going to be $70,000. The $30,000 is pretty much your profit and your closing costs. That's really where that 30% is going to go into. And your profit is, could range between 12 to 15%, depending on if there's seller concessions, depending on a lot of little things. But you're roughly in that ballpark. 70%. It, so after you take that 30 grand at the $70,000 from here, you minus all the repairs that you're going to have to make to that house. Once you minus all of those repairs, that is your purchase price. Okay. Now that is the rule of thumb. That's not necessarily how you need to run it. Right? So we don't, we typically will use the 70% rule when somebody just brings me a property and I want to do a quick analysis, just to even see if we're in a ballpark of a deal. Right. But once I'm looking at it and really analyzing it, our closing costs are not as high as other people's because we have my business partner, John, who is an agent. So he lists our houses. So that's a savings there. You understand? So our all that savings, we factor into our offer price so we can be a little more competitive or possibly make a little more profit. So all those things are factored into that formula. But a good rule of thumb is just to start 70% minus repairs. The um, 70% of A or B minus repairs is pretty much your, your maximum allowable offer, which you've seen in some places that they call it M-O-A-O, M-A-O. Um, so that's what you want to determine. Now, what is the, there is a difference though. There's a lot of neighborhoods that you're going to have ARV or FMV, fair market value. So the difference is recently we went to take a look at a house in a neighborhood that when I try to run the ARVs, I'm looking at what the max, the houses that sold for the, the most amount, they weren't completely updated. They still had dated cabinets uh, for mica countertops, um, you know, popcorn ceilings. It was just one of those neighborhoods that the houses are very well maintained and that's what moves. So when you're running that, you need to keep that in mind because that doesn't mean that your your house needs to be completely renovated. Now, when you go negotiate, that might help you because you're looking at the comps and you're seeing that all these other houses, they have the same old cabinets, the same old granite countertops, the same old bathrooms, right? Those little square tiles are like pink and green and all these funky colors. and But they're selling and they're selling pretty well. So... You understanding that, you knowing that, now you go to the house and if it looks pretty much the same, you know that there's not much work that's going to need to be done. Yes, it's dated, but that doesn't mean you need to update it because the other houses are not updated. You understand? And that also means that if your house is really jacked, that the, the one that I went to see that was really messed up, then 
all that means is that the update that I do is going to make that house sell so much faster than all the other ones. Because now you're getting pretty much, a, I, I would still target more or less the same price, maybe a little bit more, but I would still target the same price because I want speed of market. I want to put that on the market and it sell fast. And plus, I have no data showing me that an updated house will sell for more. There's no data showing me that. Now we can assume, but don't assume. All right, use those numbers. Then, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. So make sure you're you're safe on that. So that that's the difference. You have ARV, houses that have been fixed up, versus FMV, fair market value, houses that are just clean, ready to go. So determine those things. And then you want to determine speed of market. So what you want to look at is when you're running your comps, you want to look at houses that, what, how long are they sitting on the market? Is this a neighborhood that houses are taking months to sell? Or is it a neighborhood that houses are taking 30 days, 20 days to sell? You want to understand this because when you end up taking on the proper, uh, the project, you're going to have much longer holding times depending on where you're buying the house. So you want to determine speed of market. That is one thing that we invest in very heavily. When we buy properties to renovate, one of the biggest, so I, I, we like a price points, but bigger than that is we like speed of market. I'm okay going way above the price point we're usually uh, used to dealing with if the days on market are short. When all that means is that I'm going to be able to get in there, renovate it, put it on the market, and it won't sit long. Houses do not like to sit. They tend to hurt themselves. Uh, things go wrong. Things happen. They get vandalized, whatever it is. I don't like it. I don't like holding costs. I don't like it. That does not mean that you shouldn't like it. It's just I don't like it, right? So you want to determine that speed of market. You want to look at the comps and all that. Um, and again, just stress that point at the beginning. Make sure it's apples to apples, all right? If you have a house, uh, recently I had a, a wholesaler bring me a house, and he sent me some comps. He does, has no access to the MLS, so he kind of looked on Zillow what's listed. And and he he doesn't know. He's, he's new at all this. But the houses that he sent me, that the subject property was built in 2000. And the houses that he sent me were built in 1890, 1910. So over 100 years old, right? Um, that matters. The, the, the year difference matters. You understand? Because those are turn-of-the-century properties. This is the, the, a whole other century later. So the builds, the style, all that is going to matter. You want houses that are pretty comparable in style, year, everything. So make sure you keep a look on that and you look at the years, you look at the square footage. Don't compare. I saw another one that they ran comps on a 800 square foot home that was a subject property and they comped it to properties that were 1,300 square feet. Don't do that. You know, that's that's 450 square feet for 500 square feet difference. It's a huge difference. That's a whole extra master suite. That's a whole extra living room. That, that's a big difference. That's a lot of square footage. Doesn't comp the same. You understand? It's not the same price. So make sure to, you know, apples to apples. Keep that in mind. So the next thing, this is still in the analysis space. So scope of work. This is the part that most people do not take a time to put together. You need to put together a scope of work. All right. And you do this by using the comps. So again, comps, comparables, when you do your ARVs, you're determining the value. Those become your comps. What do these houses need? Do they need new kitchens, granite countertops? There goes the pen, uh, bathrooms, new bathrooms, uh, new flooring, laminate flooring, popcorn ceilings. Are they scraped? Or are they not? Uh, exterior privacy fans. New roofs, new windows, because we deal in a lot of neighborhoods that are like in the 60s and they have those aluminum windows. And then the new house, the newer rehabs, they all have brand new windows. So you got to determine that. So you look at you look at what's selling, what's already working and don't reinvent the wheel. That shit is working. Do it. All right. Don't don't try to rethink it and try to add your own spin because you saw HGTV. Forget about that. All right. Forget about what you saw on TV. Look at what's moving in that market, in that neighborhood. Neighborhoods are very different. Buyers are very different in different neighborhoods. They have different expectations. So when you're renovating a house, 
you want to make sure you're looking at that. You're looking at that, you know, what did they do here and what am I going to need to do here? That builds out your scope of work. All right. Doors. Do I need, can I leave the plain doors or do I need five panels, six panel doors? You understand? All of these things are going to matter. So you use your comps to build that out. And then you put together a very detailed scope of work. And by detailed, I mean you literally go room by room putting a scope of work together. Okay? Every single room. What do you want done? Are you switching out the plugs? Are you covering up excess plugs? Are you switching out the, the vents for the AC? Are you changing the door? Are you changing the hardware? Are you doing something to the closet? Are you changing out the baseboards? Are you changing out the trim around the doors? You know, in the kitchen, ca cabinets, uh, hardware for the cabinets, uh, garbage disposal, a new P traps, the plumbing for the cab uh, for the sink, uh, quarter turn valves. Usually, if they're old houses, I like putting new shutoff valves. Just quarter turns. They're easier. They look nice. Uh, much easier to work with. You know, refrigerator water lines. I mean, literally, go into a room and start you right or left, whatever direction you want, and go in that direction and look at everything. Are you going to put crown molding? Are you not? Uh, are you, do you have the texture walls? Do you have holes, cracks, anything in the wall, nails? I mean, you got to be so specific because have, we have contractors that paint over nails all the freaking time. Like, dude, pull the nails. You understand? Like, we're renovating the house. Pull the freaking nails out. You know, but you got to stress all these things. So you want to put a very detailed scope of work. Same thing when you go outside. Don't forget to go outside. Everybody forgets the exterior. Everybody's so focused on the inside of the house. Go outside. Same thing. The, the fascia, the trim pieces around the windows. Is there any rot, any siding that needs to get replaced? Any fascia that needs to get replaced, any windows that are cracked, look at everything, every little spot of the house. Then turn around and look at the yard. Is there any trees hanging over the house? You got to cut those branches off. Or, or is the fence in good condition? Do you got to patch it in? All of these things. And again, I did another uh, episode very detailed on how we put our scopes of work together. So I'll link on it down below so you can go check it out. But very detailed scope of work. Because this is going to help you when you hire your contractor on giving them the job that they need to do. And then again, I, I just said it, kind of skipped to it, but remember the exterior. I mean, just seriously remember the exterior because you will not you will be surprised when it's like towards the end of the project, and then you say, Oh shit, you know, I forgot the yard. And then that adds a couple thousand dollars to your budget. And you weren't even factoring that in. So remember, there's an exterior to the house. Funding. You got to have your money lined up, right? Are you going to use hard money? Hard money usually comes from these um, bigger lenders, small institutions, stuff like that, that they, they have access to a lot of capital and they'll lend you with points and interest payments and all this stuff, right? So usually, I think the going rate for starters here in San Antonio is like, three and 12 around there. So that's three points and 12% interest. Three points, you borrow a hundred thousand. That means $3,000 up front, 12% interest over the course of a year, broken down on monthly payments. Okay. So you take 12% of the hundred thousand over the course of the year divided by 12. That's what you pay monthly. They may or may not fund a hundred percent of the deal. They may fund portion of the purchase, portion of the rehab. They may fund all of the purchase, none of the rehab. It depends. Shop around. By shopping around, I mean ask other investors that use hard money lenders, that actually use hard money lenders. Not that they're friends with a hard money lender. They use them. Okay? And ask them, who do you like? Who have you been working with? Because they've gone through the process. They understand the ups and downs. There's a lot of private money lenders, uh, sorry, a lot of hard money lenders that investors just don't like to work with. We personally don't use hard money lenders. We never needed to. We take all of our funds from uh, individuals. But, you know, it's something that is available to you. Uh, I'm not a fan of it if you have other means because hard money, you tend to have a lot of draws. 
uh, they, they, you know, a lot of inspections, a lot of extra fees. I mean, it ends up costing quite a bit of money. But if you don't have another option, it is what it is. You got to take what you can get. So if the deal makes sense and it makes sense for a hard money lender, go that route. The next thing is a private money lender. It's what we use. Private money is an individual. Now, there's a lot of hard money lenders that call themselves private money lenders. It's marketing, but it's it's not really, they're not really private. Private is that you have a relationship with somebody that you know, and they have money, and they're going to let you borrow that money to do this investment. Okay? That's private money. That's from one individual to another individual. Not an institution, not any of that crap. So, private money... I like it much better because you're dealing with an actual human being that you can work things out. You know, you can talk about the project. If God forbid anything went wrong, you can work it out, try to figure it out together. Right. Uh, hard money lender, they'll just go ahead and foreclose on you. They don't, you know, they don't give a damn. It's not their problem. And they'll figure it out later with a private money lender. You know, usually you have a little more dialogue. If the project takes a little longer, they'll, They'll give you an extension. Maybe they charge you a little more, whatever, but they'll give you an extension. There's a lot of more flexibility with it. And if you build the credibility and reputation well enough, you can usually get all of the rehab and all of the purchase funded from this private money lender. So great option. But again, you need credibility. You, you, you shouldn't just be taking money from people that are just willing to give it to you if you don't know what you're doing. Um, your own money. Always an option. We were at an event a couple of weeks ago for the Alamaria and some lady asked, uh, you know, how to get private funds and all this for flips. And pretty much she said that the, the reason she's asking is because she doesn't want to risk her own money on these projects. And I was like, wow, that is terrible. You know, because the way we operate, we take care of our private money lenders money a lot more then we would take care of our own. I mean, we take care of our money, but our private money lenders money is very, very important to us because that is our whole reputation. So we want to make sure that their money is a hundred percent protected. You know, we make sure it's protected against the property. Maybe they have everything protecting them, you know, and even if anything was to go wrong, we want to make sure they're taken care of. Uh, so if that's not your intention, use your own money. If you have it, you know, what's great about using your own money is more profit for you because you don't have to pay fees, interest rates or anything like that. You just fund it yourself. So a lot more flexibility. And last thing is a money partner. You can partner with somebody. That's how we did our first rehab. Our first rehab, we had a lot of credibility wholesaling houses. And even though John and I's background is both in construction, renovations and all of that, it's very different knowing how to do the job versus knowing what job needs to be done. So we had to kind of prove ourselves. So we we partnered with somebody that had been working with us for a while and they put up the money. We brought the house, managed the renovation, did everything, and we split the profits 50-50. Now, a lot of people are like, holy crap, for somebody brings the money, giving them 50%, that wasn't our, our, our care. What we cared about was the fact that we can take down this project and start building our credibility, all right? Don't make it about the money, learn the process build the credibility so you can do more deals moving forward. Next thing to talk about. So this is the next phase is the actual flip. All right. So finding your contractors, when you find the contractor, you got to just ask people, uh, who are they using, you know, and all these things, you got to get out there network who's using who try to ask investors that are actively renovating consistently, not somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody you know, or somebody's brother or sister or whatever the hell, uh, ask somebody that actually is doing flips and ask them who they're using. All right. Get those referrals. That does not mean that that contractor is going to be perfect. Okay. I never recommend any of my contractors out. I simply tell people, Hey, here is who I use. You're more than welcome to give them a call. But I never tell them, hey, I strongly recommend this person because you just never know when they're going to decide to go to shit. You just don't know. And it happens all the time. And they may be working great for me. They more work like crap for you. We, I don't know how you manage your contractors. I don't know if you manage them the way we manage them. I don't know if you set your expectation as clearly as we do. 
I don't know how you're going to do this. So I can't recommend somebody expecting you to do the way that we do it. So never take a recommendation so serious. Just take it more as like, you know, hey, here's who we use. Try them out. And when you speak to somebody, every contractor has 30 years of experience. For whatever fucking reason, that's the number everybody likes. Um, some will even push it to 45 just to be a little more unique. But everybody has 30 years of experience. What you want to ask them is, oh, that's awesome. What did you start off doing? Oh, I started off doing sheetrock, tile, uh, framing, roof, whatever it is. Because chances are, out of those 30 years, 25 of those was doing sheetrock or tile or roof. After 2008, the financial crisis and everything happened, people start struggling. That's when everybody becomes a GC. That's when everybody all of a sudden knows how to do everything because they need to branch off. But that doesn't mean they have that experience. So the reason we ask them that is because when they tell me they started off doing sheetrock, that's what I'm going to hire them for. I'm going to hire them to do sheetrock. I don't want them to try their luck in tile. I want somebody that was, has been doing tile for a very long time to do my tile because that means I'm going to get a good job done and I need a good job done. And there are some contractors that we will try them out on other stuff, you know, to test out their skill level, but that's my discretion, not theirs. That's the risk that I want to take. You understand when there's a house, maybe that it's not too crazy. They can't really screw it up all that much. All right. Let me try your, your, your techniques and carpentry maybe. Right. So that's up to me, but you want to ask that question. Um, you want to pay contractors by scope of work. So you pretty much are paying these contractors. You give them a good scope of work, very detailed scope of work, and you pay them per scope. You never pay them in advance. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you buy the materials if they need materials. Uh, there's uh, some gurus going around saying all this nonsense about, you know, you can't buy materials or don't do whatever the hell they're trying to push down. But we buy our materials for them. This way we can just uh, pay them for their labor. You don't need to pay somebody in advance for labor they haven't done. All right. And when you pay them for a scope of work, make sure that scope of work is completed first. You got to get that scope of work completed. And again, I've done other podcasts on working with contractors, very detailed, what contracts we use, W9s, everything. So check that out. I'm going to link it at the bottom. But you want to make sure you pay them per scope when the scope is completed. You want to manage them daily. Every day, go to the project. What's going on? What's happening? You know, is this good? Is this, you know, where, where are you at? When's the next delivery? When do I need to go get the next materials? How far along are you moving? Because you need to understand, is it moving quick? Is it not? Do you need to hurry them up? Do you need to start budgeting because this is going to take longer? Are you, are they pushing you into a bad time of market? All of these things, again, I've talked about these a lot before. So there's plenty of uh, very specific content on this, but I'm just giving you that 30,000 foot view on this and setting your expectations. You want to make sure you always set your expectations correctly with your contractors because you don't want to. One thing that I always tell people is like, don't assume that they know what they need to do or how it needs to look. Don't assume shit. Tell them what you need, how you need it, where you want it, how, what your expectation is, because contractors are not seeing what the finished product is in here in your own head. You understand? They don't know that. Only you know that. So set their expectations. Set them for success. The next thing is materials. Shop around. Look places. There's a lot of places that if you buy in bulk, you get discounts. You get perks, free deliveries, whatever it may be. You get, you know, extra points or a bigger discount. So shop around. Get to know where you can find certain materials. Um, try to use what's trendy. So look around. Look at what's popular, what's happening. What, what are people expecting in houses? And try to use that material. Don't overthink it. And go to similar flips in those areas that meet that same criteria as yours, uh, as your project. And look at what they had. What did they do? What finished out? What worked? What didn't? You understand? And then go use the same things. Don't overthink it. Don't over try to reinvent the wheel. It works. All right? Use those materials. They work. Next thing is exterior. 
if it's summertime, especially in San Antonio, where we have 2000 degrees in the summer, keep up with your lawn. All right. Water your lawn. Keep up with it because it happened to us that at the end of the project would turn around. We're like, oh, crap, our grass is dead, you know, and dead grass just doesn't look really good when you're trying to sell a house. So make sure you're watering your lawn. Um, you're, you're keeping up with it and pay attention to the curb appeal. This is the thing that sells that house when somebody pulls in. All right. How does the front of the house look? Clean bushes, clean shrubs, clean everything that's just blocking the views. That's just messy. Clean all that out. Factor all those costs in because you want to make sure that, you know, you don't forget to budget for that kind of work. You understand? Because it will add up. It could add up to a couple thousand dollars. And the final piece to the uh, learning how to flip is the sell process. So you have pre-sell, right? Before you list. Do you want to stage it? That's a good, that's something that we decide to do on every single one of our houses. We always stage it because then when somebody walks in, it feels homier, right? They walk in and it feels like a home. It feels nice. They, they don't have to imagine where everything's going to go. They know exactly where things are going to go because you're showing that to them. You're showing them, here's the bed, here's a couch, here's a TV, here's everything. So they don't need to reimagine anything. Staging has worked for us all the time. It continues to work for us. We're always going to budget that in because it just helps, you know, especially when you're selling higher end homes and then professional pictures. Don't cheap out on this. Get them done. All right. I don't give a damn how nice your iPhone is. Get professional pictures because they're edited. They're done correctly. And when somebody goes house shopping, they shop online first. All right. And if the pictures look like crap online, chances are they're not going to go see the house. So spend the money, get professional pictures done. Now the listing. Now you're ready to list the house. Use the right agent. All right. Don't get a discount agent or your buddy that's an agent or your relative that's an agent. Get somebody that knows what the heck they're doing. Because when it comes time to inspections, negotiations, and all these other things, you want somebody that knows what they're doing that can protect you and make sure you get your money's worth. Because when you don't have a right agent and the other person does, they can really beat you down on the price and you just don't know any better. All because you wanted to use your brother-in-law because you owe them a favor, right? Because they suck at their life. Don't do that. <laughs> that was mean. But don't do that. Don't, don't go for a family member because you feel bad like get a real agent that knows that area that side of the market you know if you're dealing with historic homes get somebody that knows how to sell historic homes don't get somebody that sells brand new homes different ballpark all right get a savvy agent that knows how to work with that and don't get greedy speed matters don't overshoot on your house because you want to get the most because then it's going to sit on the market longer and that increases your holding cost and that makes people a little skittish. Like, why is this house sitting on the market so long? Is it have something wrong? And then you start doing price drops. Why are you dropping the price? You understand that something is something wrong with the house? You start scaring buyers away. So don't get greedy. Price it at the right price and you move it quickly. If you move fast, you make more money and you move on to the next project. And another tip is list Thursdays. If you list Thursday, you get two full weekends of it being a new listing, all right? Because it goes from new to active. And if you list on a Thursday because of the weekends, you'll get that first weekend that's going to be a new listing and the whole next weekend that's going to be a new listing. And that's going to help you because then this house is on there longer as a new listing. So it looks a lot nicer. So that's pretty much it. That's everything I have. Again, this is a 20,000 foot view of this. I have plenty of podcasts. I've done a ton of episodes, video walkthroughs of scopes of work um, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel. You can see all the walkthroughs on our website. I mean, there's plenty of content to show you step by step every single one of these in a lot deeper detail. And as always, if you have any questions or concerns or, or you just something's not making sense, call us up. We're here to help. You know, any any questions, any thoughts, shoot me an email or hit me up on social media and we'll do our best to help you out. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. And the next part of this series is going to be buy and hold. That's going to be next week. So share this with friends, family, whoever you think is going to really enjoy this part. 
and I will catch you guys on the next one.